Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all attendees to our webinar. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Wing from Impact Exhibition Management Company Limited, and I'm pleased to be your MC today. Just a few housekeeping rules for us to note. For those who are in Zoom webinar, we will turn off your camera and mute your microphone. If you have some questions for our topic or speaker in mind, please type your question under the Q&A box in the control panel. Our speaker will answer to your question at the end of the session or as soon as possible. On behalf of Digitech ASEAN Thailand team, we would like to extend our warmest welcome to distinguished speakers and attendees for giving your precious attention and time to discover together on the importance of data analytics in your decision making. Brought to you by Impact Exhibition Management Company Limited. This webinar is sponsored by the Center of Applying Data Science, or CATS in short, and supported by the Artificial Intelligence Association of Thailand. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion, I would like to guide you through to the agenda of today. We are glad to bring together renowned industry experts that make up the ecosystem of tech and digital industry. We will kickstart our session on the topic, Big Data the new dawn in decision-making by Ms. Sharala X-Ray, the founder and CEO of CATS. Our second topic is AI and data analytics skill for the future workforce by Professor Dr. Tanarat Tiramun Kong, president of the Artificial Intelligence Association of Thailand. As digitalization through data-driven business and data science are rapidly transforming the way our business operates, this is even more true with the high penetration rate of internet and mobile connectivity. Huge amount of data are being generated each day and each second. How then do we and our workforce make use of this data in our decision-making process to improve our business performance? Let us first introduce Ms. Sherala X-Ray, founder and CEO of CATS. With over 15 years of experience in the telecommunication field, Award-winning entrepreneur, Ms. Sharala established the Center of Applying Data Science, CATS, as the platform for data, analytic, and artificial intelligence, leading the data-driven business transformation and driving the benchmark for data science education in the ASEAN region. She also brought in the Data Incubator, which is an American-based data science center to Malaysia launched ASEAN First Data Science Accelerator Program in the year 2016 and spearhead an initiative with the Harvard Business School in Boston to support Malaysia's national agenda to be the hub for big data analytics. So please let us welcome Ms. Sharala to power start this session. Hi, thank you so much for that wonderful long introduction. Um, thank you, Digitech, and I'm so excited to be able to have this talk here in Thailand. Uh, bear with me, I'm calling from Sweden, so I have had some internet problems in the past. So if I get logged out, I'll be back soon, so don't panic. Uh, new norm, as we all realize. Um, this is a really exciting uh, moment and time for everybody, I think. You know, the pandemic is, is unfortunately a sad situation for all the countries globally, uh, you know, but glad there's vaccination and people can, you know, be mobilized. But my topic today would be very much about, you know, what is data driven in the new dawn. Uh, that will be very exciting how we can talk about that. Ben, uh, I have someone to help me put up the slides. So big data, the new dawn in decision making. Now, it's such a sexy word that we hear everywhere. People are talking about, you know, data scientists, big data, data-driven decision. And, you know, I have another speaker today, right? Uh, you know, uh, with Digitech uh, uh, professor who's going to talk about the AI skills. And I'm so excited. This is, you know, the aim of today's topic is to demystify the need and the difficulty of what big data and AI skills means, right? Everybody thinks that it's not for them. My business is traditional. Uh, this is only for companies like, you know, Grab. It's a company like Gojek. It's only for uh, tech companies. But what we are going to do today is to make you realize that this is important for every single business, no matter how small, no matter how big, and no matter how traditional you are, to be able to adopt this will become 
a reason for you to stay relevant and a reason for you to stay ahead of the game and your competition. So um, let's, you know, I was surprised also recently when I was trying to prepare for this talk, you know, pop cat culture, you know, you can turn it on, uh, Ben. Yeah, I mean, look at it, right? I mean, this is created in, in Thailand. This created the same impact. If anybody know about the game called uh, Flappy Bird, and you know, Flappy Bird was done in, in Indonesia and, and the developer had to close down the game because it was overwhelmed. It's fantastic. Uh, this pop cat click shows the importance or the culture that you know Thailand itself has. And what, what is exciting for me is something so simple, something so catchy. This is what the world is looking for. So kudos for your pop cat. Uh, uh, click that created a trend, uh, uh, you know, first the Flappy Bird, now you guys. And I think that so much, uh, it shows and talks about Thailand and the way the culture ties are with the digital and the way you use your phone and your internet, yeah? Uh, ben, next slide, please. So recently, Coursera released the Global Skill Report of 2021, you know? And these are all about critical and digital skills. So globally, Thailand was ranked 76. And in ASEAN, you are ranked, uh, Ben, next slide, please. Uh, you are ranked number six. That is after Vietnam and Indonesia. This does come as a surprise to me because, um, you know, from, from the, you know, uh, pop uh, cat click thing to a lot of things that I've heard and worked in Thailand, I would expect the ranking to be higher, but I think it is the same thing in Philippines. Um, although language is fantastic in Philippines and outsource, uh, outsource has been done, the way digital skills, the way data literacy skills is looked upon has not taken a hit uh, or a, what do you call a run for what is needed by the industry. So today I'm hoping after this talk, we will be able to see next year, Thailand rising up the, the ranking, you know, uh, next to Vietnam, hopefully. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a snapshot of what has happened to the world, the, the most valuable companies. We're talking about the Fortune 500 companies in just the last 10 years. If you look at, you know, uh, April 2011, the top 10 Fortune, like the, the world's richest companies you see there, almost five to six out of 10 companies here, you realize they are all oil and gas, okay? If we fast forward this thing to today, and you will see eight out of 10 of these Fortune 500 companies are tech companies. So what does it say, okay? What it says here is the only way that you are going to stay relevant the only way that you can achieve even a trillion dollar company, today Apple has reached that. The only reason that is possible is because they've gone digital, they are digital, and they use AI and analytics and data in order to grow the business. It is not possible to hire hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, people to get that kind of scalability, yeah? So just, just within 10 years, the whole world has changed from oil and gas to tech companies taking over the world, okay? So, so just so you know the importance of you staying relevant. Um, uh, ben, next slide. Okay, so having said that, understanding where Thailand stands in the global uh, skill ranking, what is really interesting is the PopCat click has created a, a relevance for what a data-driven industry is all about. This, is, this shows the culture of Thai being participating in, in, in activities, uh, and all these are internet users, uh, healthy commitment for Thai's internet-based platform. So there's a need and there's a, there's a need and a will to want to use apps, which is fantastic. And then you know the amount of you know online transaction, data transaction that it has created. Like you see, it shows the dashboard shows the world ranking. So this all contributes to the way the data industry works in Thailand. Now let's look at what and where Thailand ranks in terms of uh, you know, internet users, which then creates an opportunity for any company to become data-driven, yeah? 
as you saw, Thailand is ranked, you know, 76 globally. But when it comes to active internet users, Thailand is ranked 22nd. And I think this is amazing because in ASEAN itself, what, you have about 130 million in population, 110, 130, that you're ranked fourth. The penetration of internet is 79%. Do you know what is the global average? The global average for internet users is only 50%. So this is very exciting to me. That's almost 80% uh, penetration in Thailand that allows company to grab the opportunity to become data-driven, yeah? So um, next slide, Ben. So what does that mean to all of us? The, the issue has become big and clear as as we you know we started cats in in 2014 2015 a lot of us and we did not have the pandemic then but industry 4.0 was a big topic the biggest challenge that we find that companies struggle today in transforming if it's not for the pandemic is we are trying to solve a 21st century with a 20th century thinking and framework whatever we have learned for the the whole life like whatever i've learned in school whatever I've learned in working life has changed and is changing. But what we're trying to do is we're going to, we're trying to address it and still not upgrading ourselves to think in the 21st century, to think like what the young people would do and having difficulties doing that transition. Yeah. So I keep talking about data driven and you're wondering how does that help me with digitization? Now the next slide here will, I will, um, you know, we'll talk about in the next few slides what that is. But let's talk about ASEAN as a whole. We are trying to make changes for the 21st century, but can we also look at ASEAN as a whole? Now, ASEAN as a whole, we are the third largest population. You know, that's what I get so excited. From the GDP point of view, we are the sixth largest economy in the world, after China, India, Japan, you know, we are the sixth largest, uh, you know, GDP in the world, and it's about $3.1 trillion. 50% comes from SME, yeah? But what is even more uh, exciting yet bothers me, the next slide will show you that, having had that, the World Bank, Ben, the next slide, please. The World Bank clearly shows that we have a greater opportunity on digital, uh, what do you call, if you become a digital economy as ASEAN as a whole. And that's another trillion dollar. If we get this right, ASEAN could become the fourth largest GDP by 2025. And that's, uh, you know, China and India by itself for us, which means better healthcare, better internet, better infra. Uh, better education, you know, we eradicate poverty. There's so much you could, we could actually help the people here. But the single or the most, um, the, the, the only or the most important thing that stops this economy, this ASEAN becoming the fourth largest GDP in the world is the talent. The lack of talent skilled in IT, in data literacy, becomes really, a, a, you know, a stopper for ASEAN as an economy to move towards that. So how we can talk about uh, getting the skills in place, you know, it's a catch 22. You don't have graduates taking up data literacy or data science or understanding data as a career choice or an education choice because companies don't put out there saying that we need this thing. It's not just for, you know, IT guys. It's not for just engineering guys, it's for everybody. And I hope the next few slides we talk about, I should be able to explain to you why becoming a data literate individual and a data driven organization is so important. So let's talk about this, yeah? Uh, Shah has been talking about data driven. What is this? I wanna become digital. Why can't I just buy a technology? And I will explain to you what this means. Today's business, Everybody in today's business are looking to become a digital business. You've been hearing, right? Airlines are saying we're not airlines anymore. We are a tech company. Banks are saying we are not banks anymore. We are a tech company. You keep hearing this and tech companies doesn't really just belong to all the, you know, the Gojek and the Grab or even the telcos where they have lots of data already and they're evolving. It's for every business. So when you go from today to digital business, 
This is what we call it digital transformation. Now, a lot of companies also think that a digital transformation here means A, you buy technology and you hope for the best, or you get a chief transformation officer who comes in and implements this. It's not, it's not again, we're trying to address a 21st century uh, problem with a 20th century mindset. This is how we used to do things in the past. The way that it works for digital transformation, it doesn't. So when you do that, that's what becomes a data-driven organization. A organization needs to become data-driven where right? it should have data and analytics capability. And from that, there's three important pillars that you need to have. You need to have strategy. A strategy has to come from the C-levels. It has to be a top-down approach. It's not bottom-up, yeah? If it's not driven by your C-levels or your board of directors, you will not be able to achieve and become a digital business. Now, technology is really important, uh, but that's the least of your problem because if you have the money, you buy the technology. But what becomes really important is the data literate workforce. That becomes a, a workforce that will give you sustainability. So when you do that, then it's easy, you have a workforce that will decide what technology to buy, where do you spend? Because if you listen to, to Gartner or a lot of articles out there, I've written the articles out there, like 85% of this investment goes down the drain because not of the technology, but it's a lack of having talents in their organization. Because what happens is a lot of organization gets uh, a vendor or gets an outsourced team to decide what product you need in your organization, but your talent doesn't know how to use it because they are not data literate enough to see, to adapt, or even it does not solve or adapt to the work they're doing, yeah? So recently, I think about 2020, Bank Post have uh, done a survey, uh, has written an article which was done by PwC about less than 30% of the business leader in Thailand use digital with, with data analytics and just about 40% or less than 40% use data analytics to you know, predict, uh, to monitor skill gaps within the workforce. I know Thailand is high on manufacturing and that's really important because now we talk about smart automation, we talk about IoT. Uh, we are seeing over and over again in ASEAN that the minimum requirement for most of these companies would require some kind of diploma or digital skills to get a job. So what happens to people who are already in the organization? Do they lose their job? Are these talents easy to get? There's so many questions around it. And I hope by end of this session, I'll be able to uh, give you some insight on where you can begin and as a company and as an individual, how you can get started. Yeah, uh, next slide, Ben. So I'm gonna share with you a case study, a simple one, and I think that's very relevant. Uh, and this case study is about Air Asia. Who doesn't know about Air Asia, right? I mean, everybody knows about Tony Fernandez. And Air Asia recently uh, made it to the news in Thailand by buying a part of Gojek in Thailand. Um, there's a lot of questions about, oh, why does this airline wants to buy a tech company? Now, you've got to understand, with the pandemic, Air Asia, along with all the other airlines, have been affected tremendously. But it's always been Tony's vision to be able to see how he can diversify. And he always had the app, right? Everything was online, you know? You, the only time you see a human being is when you go to the airport. That's how Asia has always been working. And that's why they've always been successful consistently defending the world's best low-cost ca carrier because having an alliance is not cheap. And the way that they manage to keep it in low um, and cost effective is because of the way they use data. But what has happened now with the pandemic, you know, for more than two years, not being able to have that alliance, they had an expansion opportunity. Uh, you know, if you have also realized recently, AirAsia launched their super app. So what they have thought that they have about, I think, 28, 30 million uh, consumers um, data in their database. And they realized that they could actually do something about it from flight booking, catering, you know, e-wallet, uh, buying insurance, even phones, right? No tune talk. So they, they have created this super app that they could have access to everybody. And for today, they're also doing, you know, 
food, grabbing food from, uh, you know, Air Asia Kitchen. So expansion for new opportunity where no other airlines have done this, have not been agile enough, have not utilized data because they've always run the way they've done. And when the pandemic hit, some did not even survive. You have heard like thousands of Singapore Airlines, Malaysia Airlines, you know, uh, and so many other airlines have, have to let go uh, or have to reduce salary of their flight attendants. And no, no, even if AirAsia did go through that, but they held on to their people and that's because they had a plan to use their data. During or before the pandemic, one of the things they've used aggressively in their, uh, what do you call operations is to look at how they can reduce uh, the aircraft operation from, you know, saving fuel to optimizing the time to get to the plane and the number of people that's involved in that. So all that was driven by data. So just so you know, how can a traditional business like airlines, which never really makes money, and Air Asia has constantly have risen above the challenge. The only way they've done it is because they've captured data, they're using data, and they're seeking insights to look at new revenue model or optimize what they have now. So that's a small storyline that I wanted to share, challenge with, I mean, share with you guys. Now, if it's so easy, what are the challenges? Now, the biggest challenge any organization has is, uh, you know, we talk about talent because that's what World Economic, uh, you know, the World Bank has talked about. And I, we, I have personally seen it in all the organizations across the world and also ASEAN that in this pandemic, where you cannot hire and fire people, the lack of data professionals globally is not going to go away. So everybody wants them, right? IBM wants, you know, a million data scientists globally. Uh, Shopee is looking for two to 3,000 data scientists only in ASEAN. When everybody is fighting for this, how can an organization, uh, you know, challenge itself to get this talent? And what is very simple that a lot of organizations have started looking at, and I think this is important to talk about for you to become a data-driven organization is to do an augmented strategy for your human capital. So we call that a HR strategy. 54% of your own organization, your own workforce need to be upskilled and reskilled to become data literacy, data literate. Now, what is a data literacy skill? It is a critical skill required for digital skills. And that's so important. Now we talk about 30% uh, of your workforce need to be automated. The moment I say automation, everybody freaks out. Everybody goes, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my job. So the less I share, it's better, you know, and all these things. But what happens is when I talk about automation, I think it's so important people need to realize that you and I do not need or required to work 12 hours a day. You know, when farmers were working 18 hours or even more, they must have been pissed that they knew that we could now work from, you know, nine to five, okay? Who says the future of work should not be four hours? Because what we really need to do is do the thinking part, do the communication part, do the strategy part. Anything that's mundane and repeated should be done by a machine. And that's how we improve the quality of our lives, but more so for the company, it's efficiency. Remember the top 10 companies in the world? How did they reach that today? By this, by using data, by automation, by... Uh, employees will have X amount of your organization that you cannot fulfill from internally. And that's when you start looking at outside, and that's about 16%, where you look for fresh graduates or people with already with that given skills. Now, I would encourage a lot of company, and I've seen that we've been very successful in doing that, is to graduates who already have a data literate skill, literacy skill, that they can come in on board and quickly move. I recently watched um, Samsung's uh, CHRO was talking about, oh, we don't want data scientists, but we want economies, we want you know, um, any other domain that you graduate social, uh, you know, social science, but whatever you graduate from, it's important to have data literacy skills in you. And I used to say this mantra quite often that teachers and doctors would lose their job. But today I say 
teachers who don't work with technology and doctors who don't look, work with technology will definitely lose their business, yeah? So that's what I think that's the biggest challenge. Companies trying to understand where do I start and how do they uh, can get started with the journey. Having said all these, maybe it's about time. I gave a very few slides about who we are, uh, what CAT stands for. Now we are a talent intelligence uh, platform. Uh, we started with data science because we thought uh, it is still the most critical skills you need in any organization. It is the sexiest job of the 21st century. But over the years, we realized that having data scientists alone doesn't help an organization. You need to get the whole company to become data literate in order to be agile. Now, it's very simple how you empower a company to become data driven by just upskilling their workforce. The reason that CAT started in ASEAN 2014, 2015, that's very much close to our purpose. I, I used to live in, um, I'm from Malaysia, I used to live in Sweden. When I came back, I, I felt it was so important to create an economy in, in, in ASEAN that we could be ahead of the curve. You know, we are not always the, the third world country that people will give, you know, cheap labor. How can we make our ASEAN, our youths in this part, who the youngest, right? We are 50% of our population is 30 years below, which makes one of the youngest uh, talent in, in, in the world after India and China. So it was always about future-proving the world by giving everybody uh, a, a skill called data literacy so that creates an economy for the workforce. So this was how we were going to implement it, is simply by getting companies to accelerate their digital um, you know, transformation. And the way they can do it is having a workforce that understands what's required. Uh, next slide, Ben. Uh, we are in six countries. Uh, we are almost 80 employees globally. A lot of us are in Malaysia uh, and Singapore and Philippines. Uh, we are hoping to do more in Thailand. Very excited to work with Digitag. Uh, we have more than 200 uh, organizations that got into our platform. But as individuals, we have more than 12,000 individuals, a community base in the platform, which is still growing. Uh, as I speak today, yeah? Uh, that's our market presence, uh, Ben. Yeah, so what do we do? Very simple, yeah? We get into an organization, we look at their workforce, we predict where they are, we look at where they are today, we predict where they need to get tomorrow, right? And what are the skills you need to put in place and how do you, solve that. We automate a learning pathway. We match it with all the learnings that you have out there. Coursera, LinkedIn, we partner with them. If you already have them, it's even easier. And then you can actually learn on your own pace. Once that's done, you can actually apply it within the data that you have within your organization. And your organization should be able to monitor where are your employees in the state, especially when you have thousands of thousands of employees. How do you plan this upskilling? How do you plan uh, you know, at what maturity you want to be by end of the year or next year? How do you know you are in the game? How do you know you are ahead of the curve? So this is so important, especially companies like the banks, you know, when your competition doesn't come from within, right? The bank's competition is not the banks anymore. It is the e-hailing, the grabs of the world, where now they have digital uh, banking license. So when you have competition from unknown, even unthinkable, this is what we call disruption. And I think it's exciting times at the same, at, at the same time, it's also worrying for organization going like, how do I stay relevant? Yeah, Ben, next slide. So what this platform does is, you know, if you're an organization, you will have access to the community, anybody that wants to learn and understand what is data literacy about? How can I acquire that skills? We have a lot of uh, sponsors around ASEAN, which could potentially match you with scholarship or get access to free trainings that you can. And also, uh, we also have learning partners like Coursera, LinkedIn, UpLevel, that's willing to work with us for the next three to six months to be able to give free trainings for you guys if you come on board, yeah? So this is what the platform does, literally matches you where you are, what skills you need to the company. Companies that come on board with this will be able to get talent. They can also have an internal view of where they are as an organization and what skills they need 
and who are the, who are the individuals that you need to upskill. Yeah. Now let's look at another slide. I talk about the platform. I talk about data driven. Now I'm going to just give you a life cycle of what an organization could do. Now, if you're a convert and you are today, and we have almost 200 over viewers here wanting to know what is this about, why data driven becomes important. A lot of the challenges to a lot of companies are where do I begin? For a CDO or a CEO, how do I know where am I today and where I need to invest? Now, with the COVID, with the pandemic, every single penny you spend needs to be justified by ROI. Okay, your CFO will be like, oh, give me a return of investment. But people keep telling digitization means, you know, we, we have to do it, you know, uh, we have to plug and play and see if it works. If not, we will lose that. But we have enough information for companies to be able to take our data-driven organization uh, assessment that will give you a pulse view of where you are today on maturity and what's your aspiration of being tomorrow. And it also gives you all the intervention or things that you need to put in place. Um, a lot of uh, you know more mature companies who are already in this journey have issues about alignment. When you have you know senior managers, you have VPs who've been in the organization for 60 years. Now they do not. Uh, they, the, a lot of these companies have an alignment where they don't embrace or they don't get it. They go like for 60 years, I've been doing what I do, and I know this better than any data can tell. How can you get the alignment in place? How do you can get senior leadership to understand this? How do you, uh, you know, educate, uh, you know, make them a data literate leaders and all that in that platform, you'll be able to get that. Now, once you've done that for a CHRO, now a human resource, uh, chief human resource capital, uh, you know, head that we talk about is not always the last person in industry 3.0 and 2.0, I joke about it, right? HR is always the last people people remember about. But with this data-driven industry 4.0, they are the core, they are the pulse of the company. They need to be involved from the very early stages and have a workforce strategy in place, which then you realize that a Celtic will give you a bird's eye view of where your organization is today, what are the skills available, and how can you have an automated learning plan to upskill all these people. Usually this activity takes a year, with our platform, you can do it in three months. <clears throat> and it always depends on the size and you can decide who goes first, who are the quick wins that you can have while you're trying to get the data professionals from outside and you're trying to push them from other organizations. Look within is what I always say for a sustainable business model. So that's what you get from the AI platform that we have, CAT AI platform with the enterprise platform called Asalti. Uh, next slide, Ben. The data-driven organization framework has six pillars. It's so important that I talked about strategy, the first pillar. It always has to be a strategy from the sea levels to understand where you want to take the business. Like I talked about Air Asia, right? Then we need to know the organization has the culture that's ready to adapt this. So you cannot have a strategy and then expect a chief transform transformation officer to do that. It's not possible. Even to get a chief data officer to run it, it's not possible. It has to be run by the CHRO. And then to know that you have the talent in your organization that understands, walk and talks and breathes data, you need to ensure that. Technology, again, the easiest part of it, there's gazillions technology available out there, ready-made for you to buy, but what technology is relevant to you is only possible if you have the first organization culture and talent in place. If not, that's gonna be money down the drain. You have data, do you have them? Do you need to back, borrow and steal? That something comes along with, if you have a data literate workforce, they will tell you that we've been collecting this data. We need more data. We need to collect different data. We need to back, borrow or steal data, right? And then the analytics capability. You still do need to have your data science, data professional team in place. So these are the six dimensions. If you come to our platform and you take the assessment, these are the six dimensions. We'll give you an automated report with the inter intervention and recommendation reader. If, if at all, that's needed in your organization and you can quickly uh, jumpstart your digital data-driven transformation within your organization. Okay, Ben. 
I think I'm just like, you know, this could be potentially the last slide. I love this, you know, um, you know, even in Thailand, in every corner, you know, you, you, elephant is a majestic uh, animal. And I talk, we use the elephant analogy because most of the organization in ASEAN are big, strong, uh, you know, heavy lifting, like, like the elephant. Now, what happens is when you're that strong, you're not agile, okay? So how do you make an elephant fly? That's what my, our analogy is when you start and you do your uh, assessment, you can know whether you are a, you know, a, a, a sitting elephant, a standing elephant, or a walking elephant. Now, as you grow on the maturity, you become the flying elephant. So this is why the six pillars become so important. All the assessments that we have done in ASEAN in the past one year, about 300 companies, most of the organizations are in level two, which is great. That means you are in the game, okay? You're not left behind. Now, what you should aspire is whether it's okay for you to be in the game if you're not already, do you want to be ahead of the curve like Air Asia, uh, or you want to stay relevant when companies like Grab and other e-hailing companies are taking over your business. So this is why it's so important that everybody should aspire to be a flying elephant, I think. And I, I believe this is my last slide. Uh, ben, is that my last slide? And yeah, and I am, I think I cut my timing. I hope so. And, uh, you know, you can contact us and we have all the offices, the email. You can contact Digitech or, you know, if anybody have any questions, feel free. Um, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Sharala, for your insightful sharing. We will now take some questions for Q&A. A kind reminder for those who have questions to ask, Ms. Sharala, please type your question in the Q&A box or if you are on Facebook, you can simply leave your message in our live uh, Facebook platform as well. So in fact, it's quite overwhelming. We have received uh, several questions. The first question is like this. How, sorry, is what do you see is the biggest trend in data science today and your projection? What is the trend in the future? Oh, uh, you know, uh, the, the biggest trend, I think the top three, I think LinkedIn has put out in ASEAN is, uh, data science and AI specialists, okay? Followed by, I think, digital marketing and, and then, you know, uh, any other digital work. These are the biggest trends we have seen. Now, this is not going to go away. Eh? So it's not going to go away. As long as there's data and you want to stay relevant, AI becomes the biggest important thing. And you cannot do AI without data. So we see that. One of the biggest trends that we hope to change is now, when you talk about the data scientists, the, the pinnacle of it, what happens to the rest of us? What if I, I'm an economist? What if I'm a lawyer, right? What am I finance person? Oh my God, is this only for IT guys? No, it's for everybody. Anybody that comes in with a data literacy skills will have an opportunity to have a job in any organization. I just shared with you what Samsung said, right? They want anybody with data literacy skills, which means be able to tell stories with, you know, just your PowerPoint with Excel, will be able to see data uh, in a way that others don't. That's the skill that you need to bring along with the normal degrees that you might have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sharala. <laughs> yes. Okay, we have one question uh, from Mr. Praya. How to prepare IT specialists in Thailand's company in order to transform to be the data scientist in digital company? From the nice. IT specialist Relevant. to the data scientist. Yes, so, so this, uh, it's, it's much easier to talk from IT specialist than your legal or your finance or your document. So it's very easy, go in and do a, um, uh, a sanity assessment within your IT guys. Who are the one who's more inclined to become a data literate uh, individual? So there are hard skills that you can do assessment on. There's 32 skills that we look at, and there's, um, we call it smart skills that you can look at whether they can become a data leader, they can become a changer, uh, empathetic communicator, not just doing the job at the back and just programming. So once you have, have that visibility, you can actually build a very strong team within the company. Uh, I call it the engine uh, that's really strong, then you can actually transform your IT guys to do that. But you must also know that you can have a very strong engine. Uh, you know, you can have a Ferrari engine, but if you have it in a Honda body, 
your, your tires and your windshield is going to fall apart. So while you build a strong team with your IT, it's also important the rest of the organization comes on board with becoming data literate, yeah? Okay. Yeah. And we have a question from the medical industry. Um, if Sharala can share, how do you use the big data in the medical or hospital market? Oh, I, I, I think uh, I think healthcare is the God-given uh, industry to use data. You know, um, I, I live I live in Sweden, so so I live. Uh, you know, I come here for a while. You, you know that there are ten million in population, and they always have a shortage for skilled workers because you have social security here that everybody wants to become a professional, right? But medical medical industry is one, but they are so advanced in using data to eliminate uh, walk-ins if it's not necessary. So, so a lot of things like, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to talk about the COVID yet. I'm just talking even normal thing. Do you know, sending a digital reminder for people a day before uh, eliminates 80% dropouts. 80% of people usually don't turn out for their appointment. By just enabling those digital reminders, you eliminate 80% 80, 80 of them do turn out. For, for the for the uh, appointment that's given, things like that. Uh, the pandemic uh, has created, uh, you know, a data uh, craziness where people know where you're vaccinated, where you're not. Uh, you know wh why it's causing that, what age group. Uh, you know, so healthcare has always been the, the 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 most important industry, I think, to be able to use data in giving better customer service, looking at scanning and predicting cancer, looking at, you know, uh, virtual reality where you're, you know, there's so many things and I can't begin to, I will use up another hour, my dear, if you, but I think um, it's very important that doctors embrace data, digitization, making decisions, using uh, clients' data for the longest they have and, and you know, uh, to do a lot more than you can do for healthcare. Yes, I believe there is a, a lot more to dig deeper for the medical uh, sector, especially so which um, you can contact to cats after this to have a personal consultation yeah. session as well. So but we but have- You, you do know, right, these guys come from a science background, so to, and, and analytical, to transform them to become a data literate so much easier than finance and economics. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah, our question uh, is, May I ask for the collaboration with Coursera? Does it mean that if um, the, this person take the CATS course, um, he can also take the, take the Coursera course for free? Yes, and it's available for the next three to six months. You come to the platform, you register yourself, it'll do an assessment and give you a learning pathway and it'll give you a recommendation uh, between Coursera, LinkedIn, we have Cloud Suite on, on the platform and you can have that for the next three to six months. So grab that opportunity, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a question uh, which is from the chemical process engineer. He said that I am a chemical process engineer. How will data skill, um, how will it benefit me? Okay, I will tell you, one of our biggest clients in the, in the beginning before the pandemic has been oil and gas. Okay, they have been the one that, you know, when, when, when they were affected by, you know, uh, because chemical could be anything. But having said that, these are the alternate energy they're looking at. Companies need to know, uh, even Shell is looking at the lubricant. They're looking at their centers, uh, all the Shell centers. They call it uh, commercial centers. So it doesn't stop you from just becoming the chemical engineer. That allows you a career progression within your organization to move forward with other things and just being a chemical engineer. So I think, uh, you know, if your company hasn't started, it will, if it doesn't, then you will have to make sure in order for the company to stay relevant, they have to embrace this. And then you will realize what's your relevance. Okay. Yes, we have a question also like this. We have 12,000 data candidates that have gone through CATS. What is the ROI that you have seen being delivered? Oh, um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be uh, very proud to say, right? Uh, when these guys get on our platform, especially the fresh grads, a, uh, 80, more than 85% of them get immediately employed and their average salary, even in Singapore itself, they're willing to pay 
50% more than a normal graduate. Okay, so, so we have seen this, that people are willing to pay more if you come equipped with that. So first you get a job because this, this, is, this pandemic has become quite a hard time to get jobs, right? People don't want to hire, people don't want to fire. And, and this allows you because there's always a need for data literate position within the company, always. So you get a job quickly, second, you can demand a higher pay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think due to the limited time, we will come to the last question. Um, in the national level, how big data can assist business operation in Thailand? I, this is why I think we're doing what we're doing today with Digitech, right? It's, it's really important that an organization that embraces this change, change cannot do it by themselves. Uh, universities cannot do it themselves. So it's important to bring the government into it to help that. You've seen that in Singapore, you've seen that in Malaysia, where the government um, incentivize organization to uh, employ fresh graduates with certain, we call it critical skills. Uh, incentivize, gives tax exemption for uh, companies to be able to upskill their workforce so they can stay in the work because there's a whole ripple effect when a company goes bust, when people lose their jobs, you know, it, it's something that it's a social uh, disaster. So uh, at, a, at a national level, it's so important that this is not just a private sector's problem alone. It's not just university problem alone. This is where the, the government, the private sector and the, and the supply comes together and identify the critical skills for the future and, and short term and long term, yeah, that they need to work on that. And, and I'm hoping to see more of that in Thailand. Yes, definitely. We, we understand um, the needs and also the skill gap that is currently exists, especially for Thailand. And of course, we look forward for our government to um, train or reskill our employee and also look at our future generation of talent to get ready for the future workforce as well. So that is actually, we have more questions than that, but due to the time limitation, we have to move on to the second topic. And for any question from our attendee that is not addressed yet, don't worry, we will, we already like track down all the questions and we will uh, share it with Ms. Sharala for her to get, and her team to get back to you after that. So thank you, Ms. Sharala, for your interesting sharing and your advice to all those questions and also having a lot of uh, interesting case study and um, that have let us understand what is the situation of Thailand. I believe that we have all benefited from this discovering session and we ourselves and also our, our company can now begin to consider where we stand in our journey of data understanding and in order to um, think about how to make a uh, or improve our decision-making process.